Hello everyone, welcome to our monthly InfoSec seminar organized by the Information System Security and Assurance Management Department in Mahalshan School of Management. This year, we are celebrating the MESAM program's 10 years anniversary, and we are pleased to start this celebration with an interesting talk from Dr. Shona Gili about from conception to delivery, the journey to publishing a blockchain-based manuscript. Dr. Shona Gili is a full professor of management and lead faculty in the Master of Information Systems Assurance Management program at Concordia University of Edmonton. MESAM is Canada's first and only graduate level program in information systems auditing. Professor Gili holds a total of 15 professional designations. These include certifications as a management accountant, a financial services and the government sector internal auditor, and risk assurance specialist, a fraud examiner, and, uh, and information system auditors, and an information system and the cloud security professional. Dr. Agili also holds several blockchain related certifications, such as certified blockchain expert, certified blockchain solutions architect, certified blockchain security professional, and certified blockchain project manager. John is an award-winning author whose publication portfolio includes over 90 published articles, book chapters, and conference proceedings, in addition to two personal finance books and two IT auditing book titles. His latest, latest books are entitled Fraud Auditing Using CAATT, a manual for auditors and forensic accountants to detect organizational fraud, and the Auditor's Guide to Blockchain Technology Architecture Use Cases uh, security and assurance. Thanks, Sean, for being with us today, and thank you all for attending this seminar. And please, for those who are attending without Concordia email addresses, please register at uh, the link uh, that I will share with you in the chat area to receive your attendance certificate. And ju just one quick note, we will not take questions during the presentation today. So please, if you have any question, you can write it in the chat area or wait till the end of the presentation and Dr. Sean will answer the questions at the end. Thank you. It's all yours, Sean, now. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Thompson, for giving me the opportunity to uh, participate in your information security webinar uh, this morning. And uh, so uh, today I'm going to talk to you about an experience that um, uh, we uh, had uh, a couple of years ago uh, that uh, culminated in the publication of uh, a very collaborative research project. And uh, as you can see from the slide here, the book is entitled uh, The Auditor's Guide to Blockchain Technology, Architecture, Use Cases, Security, and Insurance. And so I'm going to spend perhaps about 10 minutes to talk a little bit about this particular experience. Uh, I do realize this is an information security webinar, so I don't want to take the time, the, the entire uh, 60 minutes to just talk about the uh, this particular publication, but I do want to spend a few minutes on it before um, I get into some very fundamental uh, information regarding this particular uh, technology. And then uh, as, as part of that, uh, towards the end, I will uh, quickly also uh, talk a little bit about some of the security challenges. Uh, as you may know, this uh, disruptive technology is still in its infancy. And so uh, there are a number of uh, security uh, challenges that need to be uh, overcome. So to talk a little bit about the uh, project itself, this was, uh, uh, I, I conceived this project at a time when, where we had record numbers in both the MISM and the MISAM program. So uh, I was uh, one of the three, uh, I believe one of the three uh, research supervisors along with uh, Dr. Budakov and uh, Dr. Lynn Scott. And uh, I ended up with a, overall research cluster comprised of a total of 53 MISM and MISAM students. And the breakdown approximately was about two thirds MISM students and about a third of assurance students. So um, I need to uh, backtrack here and 
talk a little bit about how I came about knowing about blockchain. Uh, my first exposure to the technology was uh, about uh, three, four years ago when I read a, an article in Strategic Finance magazine, uh, which piqued my interest. And then that was followed by uh, watching a couple of TED Talks. Uh, and that prompted me to read the uh, NIST publication related to this particular technology. And by the time uh, I did all of these things, I was uh, becoming a a blockchain enthusiast. And this is how I refer to myself even to this day. Uh, not a blockchain expert. I'm, I'm still learning about the technology, but uh, I, I think that it has some tremendous uh, potential vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Web uh, 3.0. And uh, so after that, I uh, realized that I wanted to learn more about this particular technology. And that I, uh, as, as, a, as a result of that, I uh, embarked on a series of professional development activity. I started uh, by taking an online course at the Linux Institute uh, the, uh, to, to get a certificate uh, uh, entitled uh, Blockchain for Business. And then I followed that up with some additional studies uh, through the uh, Blockchain Training Alliance and the uh, Blockchain Council. I studied for a number of certifications, uh, got certifications as Dr. Abdallah uh, alluded to in architecture, security, and project management uh, uh, re regarding technolo uh, blockchain technology. And so when this opportunity rolled around, um, I thought I developed a vision that wouldn't be nice since we have such a large group of students if we can uh, create some sort of a deliverable, a very comprehensive deliverable uh, that and my vision was maybe, you know, perhaps if everything works uh, well, uh, we can publish it one day. So I, when we, uh, when this opportunity presented itself, uh, I ended up, as I mentioned before, with a total of 53 students. Uh, which I then, um, having had a little bit of a, a, a background in the technology, uh, took my calculator out and started uh, figuring out how to do this. And so I figured, let's uh, set uh, our vision uh, in terms of publishing a book. And I, after doing some basic math, I, th I thought that if we have 15 chapters and I started developing an outline, and I put somewhere between two, a minimum of two to a maximum of four students per group. We're going to come up with a total of 15 uh, research teams. And based on my previous studies over the past six, uh, the, the previous six or eight months, um, I started creating uh, an outline for the book with each chapter, a title for each and every chapter, and uh, created those teams. and. So each team was assigned a very specific topic. But in addition to that, at that point in time, I knew enough about the technology to also give them an initial outline. So I would say, uh, team one, you're doing this topic. In this topic, I want, uh, I want you to address the following uh, topic and subtopics so they knew exactly uh, what are what were the main points or the main topics in each chapter that they had to research and develop? Uh, all of that was also uh, what, what became a, a reality uh, thanks to the aid of two of my uh, GAs, uh, Amandev Singh and Yatunde Atkinson, uh, that were acting as first line copy editors. So. We were meeting on a weekly basis, and the rule was that uh, they had uh, every week, each team had to write so many words, um, uh, and then they had to take that draft, edit it at the team level, uh, escalate it to the uh, first line copy editors, and then I would take a look at that uh, that 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 section and do my content editing, and you know provide the uh, necessary uh, advising. So we were talking about 15 chapters uh, and all of the chapters, uh, I, I created a template that each and every team was following. And we did this project over the course of two semesters. 
And what is also interesting about this is that due to COVID restrictions, we had to do all of this online. So I was meeting on a weekly basis, going section by section uh, with each and every team. And after the team, uh, everyone delivered, uh, submitted their deliverables uh, and graduated. Uh, I obviously had to stay behind and spend a better part of my summer and the following fall uh, to do a deep copy and content editing. And so finally, uh, the manuscript was all ready to go in March of 2022. And uh, I sent it to uh, CRC Press. Uh, by that time, we had signed a contract and uh, the book was finally published on November 9th, 2002. So just, uh, to, just to say, say a couple more things about this experience, uh, this was kind of a qualitative research, and I essentially uh, broke it into two uh, phases, which were it was essentially the methodology that the entire department was uh, following at that time. So in uh, it, back in those days, we were still on the 60 credit uh, programs, so we were calling those RM2 as opposed to Capstone 1. So in that RM2 class, after I had given them a their particular topic and an initial guideline uh, or an, init an initial outline saying that these are the topics and the subtopics that you need to cover in your chapter, then each and every team went into work and they started looking up for references for each one of those uh, topics and subtopics. And to uh, incorporate a bit more of uh, quality control, I stole an idea from Sean Thompson. And uh, this was an idea that I actually liked a lot, but, but because um, I, uh, when I was growing up, I was going to French immersion and they would let us uh, make us do these kind of time, uh, type of things. So we had to read a passage and we weren't, we, uh, we're not calling it precess, we we're calling a resume, which is, you know, a summarization in French. Uh, so I, I knew that uh, this was a, a good tool and uh, I started incorporating it into this, uh, uh, into this project. So the idea was the students would, for each and every reference based on certain guidelines that I had given them, they would re, uh, study the reference, create a precess, which is nothing more than a, a short document in bullet point format where the essential and relevant points for every, uh, uh, for, for, for every reference were listed in there. And so they were reading the references, creating a precess, next reference, uh, uh, et, et cetera, et cetera. And then the sum total of all these bullet points were at some point migrated into that initial guideline that I had given them. And we would, uh, we called that uh, final uh, document a detailed chapter out outline. So make a long story short, at the end of RM2, each and every team had their uh, entire research outlined. And these documents were 25, 30 pages that where they, uh, everything under my supervision was uh, done point by point, and uh, I was checking for organization and flow, and so everybody was ready to go. The next semester when we came back, we had the plan uh, in terms of that research proposal ready to go, and then we started focusing on the writing and editing of each chapter over the past uh uh, over the next uh, 13 weeks. So this is how we put this together. And the end result was, a, uh, as I mentioned before, a 15-chapter uh, book. Uh, chapters 1 and 2 and 3 are what I call foundational chapters. So, for example, if you just want to learn about the technology and uh, you, you don't want to spend, uh, you, you don't want to read the whole book, uh, the first three chapters will give you the foundations needed uh, in terms of the technology, architecture, its various components, the role of tokens and cryptocurrencies uh, uh, as it pertains to 
uh, blockchain. Uh, so you can just read the first three chapters. Then we started looking at some use cases. And uh, on purpose, I, I tried to follow, uh, I, I tried to adhere to three main areas. In other words, finance, uh, supply chain management, and accounting. And for simple reason that those were the three areas that I knew something about. So uh, I could better, uh, I was in a, I felt that I was in a better position to provide advising to my teams. So chapter four, five, and six are the various use cases in these uh, three areas. And then chapter seven is a side-by-side-by-side -by -side -by -side comparison of three blockchain frameworks, namely Ethereum, uh, Hyperledger, and Corda. And in this chapter, the team pulled out the technical papers uh, from all these three frameworks and did a side-by-side-by-side -by -side -by -side comparison of their various capabilities and constraints uh, as it pertains to developing various business use cases. Moving on to chapter eight, nine, and 10, that's another triple puncher, so to speak. Uh, we uh, covered uh, various considerations vis-a-vis uh, -vis designing, developing, and auditing various blockchain applications. And then we get into chapter 11, 12, uh, 13, and 14, that's where, um, actually chapters uh, 12, 13, and 14, uh, we, we get into various risk and governance considerations. The last two chapters are chapters that deals with security. We looked at this technology at the user, network, and system levels. We, uh, we uh, researched uh, the, the common attacks and the mit mitigation techniques. And chapter 14 is uh, actually focused uh, uh, on smart contract vulnerabilities, which are automated uh, mechanisms within a uh, blockchain environment uh, that uh, perform various tasks. And then we topped it off with chapter 15 uh, for organizations that do not have the resources or, or the means to build a blockchain system uh, from scratch, then these uh, uh, organizations can opt for uh, a, subscrip uh, a subscription uh, service as far as blockchain is concerned. So we, uh, the uh, last chapter uh, focused on uh, blockchain, uh, various uh, blockchain as a service uh, uh, offerings that are available at the present time. So I just wanted to show you this slide here. As you can see here, uh, this is uh, uh, just a couple of screenshots put side by side from the book. And as you can see here, the, each, the names of each and every uh, student in, in the team uh, appears uh, in each chapter. And of course, I'm the common denominator because I was kind of like a quarterback or a project manager. And, uh, you know, I was the... Uh, uh, you can you, you could call me. I was the uh, project editor to to, to speak, and uh, based on the some of the feedback that I got from the students and I've read uh, on social media and so on and so forth, um, I'm pleased to say that this had appeared to be an extremely positive and uh, uh, enjoyable um, experience. Uh, in terms of uh, all the students involved. So at this stage, uh, I want to kind of <clears throat> leave this behind a little bit and get into the second part of my presentation and uh, uh, provide uh, uh, you guys with uh, a few basics as far as this disruptive uh, technology is concerned. Perhaps the best place is to start with a definition. And I like this definition uh, by Isaka uh, that says that a blockchain is a shared transactions ledger that can be accessed by multiple parties using cryptography and peer-to-peer -peer technology in order to secure data into blocks and store them into an immutable chain of transactions without any trusted central authority. So essentially, we're talking about some sort of a ledger on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. This particular ledger is uh, secured uh, through the application of a number of crypto, uh, cryptographical 
uh, technologies uh, spanning from uh, symmetric and asymmetric and, and hashing. And uh, the data is then uh, tied together into uh, blocks. That's where the term blockchain came uh, comes from. And they are stored into an immutable chain of transactions. That means that once you put something on the blockchain, you cannot go back and delete it. So if you need to make certain uh, changes to that particular uh, transactions, uh, you have to do this through some sort of an adjusting transaction or a reversal transactions, uh, but you can you can go back and delete that transactions. And all of that is done without any trusted central authority. An example of a trusted central authority could be uh, a particular organization or in the uh, in a financial use case, the, the, the bank typically when we do transactions is our is the central authority. Uh, but uh, the beauty of this system is that it can be self-governing and it can be completely decentralized. So perhaps it would be useful to think of a blockchain as a decentralized, peer-to-peer, -peer, cryptographically secure, immutable database. And the the first thing here, the decentralization, that's uh, uh, it depends on the case use. The, the, if uh, Scotia Bank is implementing a blockchain system and it belongs to Scotia Bank, then we can't say that this structure is truly decentralized. It's not because it belongs to an organization. But if we you take the uh, you know uh, uh, if you if you take uh, cryptocurrency trading into consideration, it is a very uh, self-sustaining and decentralized um, mechanism that allows people to buy and sell uh, cryptocurrency without the oversight of any regulatory in entity or any banking entities. So some of the main attributes of blockchain is the fact that blockchain uh, information is deemed as pseudo-anonymous. In the, in the sense that uh, transactions are linked to wallet addresses and, and public keys. And so what is uh, fun the first time you go on a, a one of these cryptocurrency uh, blockchain platform is the fact that you can see how much money different are in different accounts. But the, pro, the, but the issue is that you don't know to whom that particular account uh, belongs. So, uh, and this is done on purpose because if you and I are conducting trade, this gives you the opportunity to look into uh, my wallet address in order to determine if I have enough funds to uh, close out that financial transaction. So you can see how much Bitcoin are in a wallet, but you don't know to whom that particular address belongs. And as I mentioned before, this particular uh, technology uh, is distributed, which makes it more resilient, more reliable. Component failure is minimized. Uh, it is uh, very often decentralized, which eliminates the need to trust a central authority. Because if you and I are doing business, uh, there is in, uh, uh, a risk in finance that we refer to as counterparty risk. That means that uh, if I want to buy something, uh, I'm relying on the fact that uh, you have something to sell me. And so in order for this um, transaction to uh, go to completion, there's often a entity, let's say a bank, that guarantees that it can counter party risk. In other words, if I can't and meet up with... Uh, uh, my end of the bargain and or the other party cannot meet their end of the bargain. If necessary, the bank can step in as a central authority and guarantee the transaction. Blockchain is also immutable in the sense that now we often use the acronym CRUD, C-R-U-D, uh, to describe the four basic uh, abilities of a, a database system. Well, there is no delete in blockchain, right? So data 
is append only and cannot be mo modified. And so, um, and if you try to modify it, uh, first of all, it's going to be something that's going to be extremely difficult and expensive to do. But most importantly, even if theoretically an entity is able to do so, um, it's going to be become very apparent very quickly. And then finally, uh, one of the main strengths of this particular technology is that it's it's uh, transparent nature. So as you can read here, transparency allows for transaction history uh, to be more easily audited, which is a uh, really great news for auditors because it provides us with a new source of uh, cryptographically secure uh, audit trail that uh, will make uh, audits more uh, efficient and more reliable and provide better assurance. So I wanted to show you this, just in case you're interested, how to, uh, how on the Bitcoin uh, platform, uh, a public key uh, issue to, to an individual or an entity uh, is used to uh, create a wallet. And this is done through a number of uh, uh, cryptographic uh, hashing processes using different cryptographic algorithms. So imagine that we have a public key, as you can see at the, the top of this figure. And then so th there are seven steps that where we keep hashing and rehashing and rehashing um, this public key to arrive at the final result in uh, step number seven. So from the public key uh, using SHA-256, we hash it once, we hash the public key once, and then the uh, output is hashed with yet another cryptographic algorithm, the RIPE MD160, and uh, that result, that that output uh, uh, goes to uh, step number three, where the network bytes, those three zeros, are added to the results, and then the uh, output is hashed two more times using two uh, using SHA-256. So, in step four, we rehash uh, the output from step three. We rehash it again. Uh, we hash uh, the, the resulting uh, output in step four is rehashed in step five. And then in step six, the first four bytes from the result uh, of uh, step three is added to that output before it is encoded using base 58 encoding. Very often when I uh, people ask me about uh, blockchain and I try to explain what blockchain is, the typical answer for some uh, from somebody who doesn't know anything about this technology is they say something like, oh, okay, well, so this is Bitcoin, right? This is what you're talking about. And so it's important to distinguish the fact that Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency that trades on a blockchain platform. So Blockchain is not Bitcoin, just as much as Bitcoin is not blockchain. Blockchain is the engine that enables Bitcoin or any type of cryptocurrency uh, trading. Now, because of its attributes, because of some of the things that I've been talking to you uh, for the past few minutes, the big question is right now, how can we take this uh, technology and use it towards other use cases. So we are looking at, by we mean the, the, the blockchain community, uh, is currently looking at various use cases for online banking. Uh, right now, we, in, in my current uh, cluster, we're looking at how to take blockchain and provide banking services to uh, the underserved in parts of the world. Uh, where uh, basic banking services are not available uh, to a lot of people. Uh, blockchain is actually also, uh, and that's probably one of the uh, more solid use cases for blockchain at the present time, uh, seems to uh, be carving a place in the supply chain management sector. Uh, Walmart is using uh, blockchain to trace 
the journey of various food that it se- that it sells in 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 its stores you know such as i don't know beef from argentina or oranges from florida or mandarins from uh, china it uh, enables a better uh, monitoring of various food sources into stores uh, another uh, team currently is looking at uh, uh, some of the best practices that can be incorporated in voting with all the things that have happened uh, in a, you know in with, with mr trump in the uh, united states and uh, some of the uh, fraudulent um, election processes in Russia or Iran and other parts of the world. How can this particular technology bring more integrity and lessen any type of uh, corruption and fraud uh, as far as voting is concerned? I think it's a technology that um, is particularly well suited to disaster recovery purposes due to its peer-to-peer uh, decentralized uh, uh, structure. We're looking at uh, there are, uh, not only us, but as well as other, a number of other organizations are looking at how to use this particular technology to bring telemedicine, just like bringing financial services or banking services to parts of the world where uh, medical care is scarce. And then the top one here, the uh, on, on the very top, the whole idea of decentralized finance, which is uh, my little pet project, because my background has always been business. And ever since I was a first year university student, uh, business student, I always I, I developed an affinity for finance. And uh, I kind of went through a very long uh, finance journey. And it's very interesting how IT and finance are meeting together here and uh, I, I, which enables me as an individual to combine uh, my two areas of interest, namely finance and the whole idea of uh, blockchain. So a little bit of history because this blockchain business got a pretty interesting history. The whole thing started in the early 1982. There was a fellow by the name of David Chung who was a doc- doctoral uh, student at uh, University of California in Berkeley. And as part of his doctoral dissertation, uh, Mr. Chum uh, wrote a dissertation that uh, where essentially he uh, uh, proposed this blockchain system uh, the way um, it is right now, except for its consensus algorithm. We'll talk about that in just a a uh, few minutes. And he did extensive work uh, developing uh, the first electronic cash uh, based on the theory that the world needs a version of cash as private and as secure as fiat money. And so fiat money is just regular currency, the regular bank currency. So he started working on that. And while he was working on this, uh, Microsoft got wind of some of the things that uh, he was doing. They came knocking with a check for $180 million to try to uh, buy this technology called DigiCash that he was developing. And for some reason that I'm not sure about, uh, Dr. Trump said, no, I I guess that wasn't enough money. And uh, sadly enough, after he refused, uh, the Microsoft's uh, offer of 180 million because Microsoft wanted to incorporate this DigiCash in uh, Windows 98. His company uh, went out of business, so uh, DigiCash Corp went bankrupt a little while uh, later. And then after that, there were some other attempts to develop digital cash alternatives uh, such as eGold, but none of those were successful. Fast forward to 2008, an individual that used the assumed uh, name Satoshi Nakamoto. We don't know who this individual is. Is he a man? Is he a woman? Is he Japanese? Is he American? Uh, Nobody knows anything about this individual. He uh, or she published a paper calling for the development of a cryptographically secure currency uh, along the same ideas that um, uh, Trump had, 
independent of any central banks. But what was different about his paper is that uh, he kind of expanded on Chum's original idea uh, by proposing a, um, a, a, a consensus algorithm that he called proof of work. And uh, we'll talk about this, as I mentioned, in just a few minutes. And so he published this paper. And if you're interested in reading Nakamoto's conceptual paper, you can find it on the Bitcoin platform. And uh, I have a link here that uh, I hope either Dr. Abdullah or uh, Mr. Thompson are going to cut and paste into the chat function if you want to take a look at it. And uh, so after uh, the publication of this paper uh, in 2009, Bitcoin came into existence. And shortly after, Satoshi Nakamoto just dropped out of the face of this earth. Nobody has ever heard from him ever again. Uh, however, he does have a wallet on the Bitcoin platform. And uh, it is estimated uh, that uh, based on the number of uh, tokens that uh, uh, coins that he has in this wallet uh, and this is a 2021 valuation based on the price of uh, bitcoin his net worth is estimated was estimated back in 21 to be about 70 billion dollars which would uh, make him the 15th richest person in the world and a uh, little bit of a fun fact um, looking at this slide the last uh, bullet point uh, it, there are a number of uh, fairly reliable sources uh, that believe, we don't know for sure, that believe that that is Satoshi Nakamoto's uh, wallet address on Bitcoin. So if you want to get on the Bitcoin platform, you can certainly look up this wallet address and verify for yourself. So continuing our talk about the this this disruptive uh, technology, uh, we can essentially start out by uh, making the first distinction by saying that blockchains can be public or they can be private. And this has to do with who can actually put data, who can write to the blockchain. So if it's a public blockchain, just like the cryptocurrency blockchain, such as um, uh, Bitcoin, Everybody can add a record. Anybody can buy and sell, right? But if it's a private uh, type of a blockchain, let's say a type that belongs to a particular organization, then uh, through uh, the implementation of access control, only certain participants can actually put data on that blockchain. So furthermore, we can say that not only blockchain can be public, or private, we can do a further distinction by saying blockchains can be open or blockchains can be closed. And that revolves around who can actually read information, who can read the data on the blockchain. So if, again, if it's an open blockchain, there are no restrictions, everybody can read uh, the data. However, if it's a closed blockchain, right? So for example, it's a blockchain that belongs to the Alberta Health uh, services, then that means that through the implementation of uh, permissions and access control, only certain participants can actually have access and read the data. Uh, you will also see the term permissioned and permissionless. And permission, permissionless is kind of relates to closed and open. Uh, and uh, essentially, as the uh, terms denote, it has to do whether uh, the uh, system or the blockchain has access control uh, incorporated or it is truly uh, an open system. So you can mix and match this, these, these four types. You can have a blockchain that can be public and closed, right? So it, uh, a, a, uh, an example of that could be a blockchain that could be incorporated for the purposes of uh, conducting an election. Whereas I can see how I voted, but for example, I cannot see how Dr. Abdullah voted, right? Or it can be a blockchain where uh, that can be used for the purposes of implementing a whistleblower hotline. Uh, a, 
Blockchain can also be public and open. Uh, cryptocurrencies or video game based uh, blockchains are a perfect example of that. It could be completely closed off. It could be private and closed for highly confidential information. Uh, you know, could be possible use cases related to the military or law enforcement, uh, law enforcement, or some sort of a taxing uh, uh, entity like uh, the IRS in the United States or CRA in uh, Canada. Or it can be a private means that it belongs to. A particular organization but it could be open so for example i could uh, go to walmart and look at stakes uh, and uh, take out my phone and scan the tag on the stake uh, suppose that i i'm, I'm a very pe peculiar uh, eater i want my meat to be organic let's say i'm a devout muslim for example and i want my meat to be organic i want it to be halal I want it to be processed a certain way. And so I can make sure as to the origin of that meat, where is it coming from? How was it slaughtered? How was the cattle fed? How long did it take for it to get to the store? And you can even get fancier. You can put some sensors on in, in those steak boxes. And so these sensors, let's say they're temperature sensors and they can uh, issue alerts if the temperature in those boxes go above or beyond a certain acceptable range. So it really, uh, by, by virtue of being a cons consumer, having access to that particular uh, blockchain, I can know exactly where this beef is coming from and what was its journey. Now, blockchains, your typical blockchain is comprised of four layers. You have the data layer, and uh, then you have the business logic layer, and that's where smart contracts reside. And in order to have smart contracts, uh, you need to have what we call a Turing complete platform, right? So let me just go back for a second. And for those who are not familiar with the term smart contracts, let's describe what a smart contract is. So a smart contract is nothing more than code residing on top of blockchain and the code says for example if condition a happens then perform task task x if condition b happens then perform tax task, uh, task y right so what this does it 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 uh, provides for automation so that the decision is made by code right as opposed to uh, using the brain of a human being. And so for uh, in order for these devices, the, the, these, these codes, these smart contracts, to be functional, they need to be on a Turing complete platform. Bitcoin is not a Turing complete platform. Bitcoin cannot accommodate smart contracts uh, at, at the present time. And so there are some uh, improvements to the Bitcoin frameworks that, uh, uh, such as Ethereum, Hyperledger, Okorda, uh, that are more advanced uh, blockchains, they're Turing complete, and as such, they allow for uh, the incorporation of smart contracts. So in addition to a business logic layer, there's also a messaging layer that enables communication. And then if we are using this particular blockchain, let's say for e-commerce purposes, then uh, there is a token model. Uh, uh, in other words, it, it, we have the capability to use cryptocurrencies to perform various business functions. What blockchain does not have is a user interface layer, which needs to be developed if uh, a blockchain uh, project implementation uh, project is uh, is uh, is in the works, and also keep in mind that due to its peer-to-peer -peer decentralized architecture, a, a well-designed blockchain should be uh, DDoS resistant. So this is how information is chained together on a blockchain. So we have in this slide, let's say we have three um, blocks. 
And what you don't see is block number zero, which we refer to as the Genesis, uh, Genesis block. So as you can see here in block one, the block of the previous block, the Genesis block is hashed along with the, uh, uh, the hash of the uh, transactions in that block. And that block now is going to be chained or tied to the second block. In other words, the hash of block one is going to be a part of block uh, uh, two, and et cetera, et cetera. So for example, if I was a, uh, a black hat and I wanted to mess around with the transactions in block three, if I change that uh, block three, then this, this is going to uh, give uh, produce a different hash for that block. And that block, uh, that hash is not going to be the same as the hash from block three that is going to be in the next block, in block four. So if I want to change information, then that means that from block three, I got to go back. Uh, I, whatever block I'm at, I'm, I have to work backwards and change the hash on all of these blocks, uh, which is something that is uh, theoretically extremely expensive, if not impossible. Uh, that That is something that uh, hasn't been done yet. And uh, will uh, and, and once you start messing with the uh, transaction in a particular block, that you you can it, the the fact that that particular block has been compromised will become very very obvious. So one of the things that uh, the decision let's put it this the decision to put all these various transactions for example that you have seen in a previous uh, block to to uh, this transaction to put it in a block is uh, finalized through what we call a consensus. Uh, methodology. And so the first thing that um, Satoshi Nakamoto came up with was a consensus methodology by, that, that he called proof of work. So as you can read from the uh, slide, uh, there are processing nodes on the Bitcoin uh, platform that uh, we refer to as miners. These miners, they their business is to compete to solve the cryptographic problem that will enable them to put to to win the rewards of putting a block together, and I will uh, expand on that very shortly. So, the problem with proof of work uh, is that it is a very expensive and uh, entails extremely high electricity consumption, and this is how it works. Oh, before I say that. Let's talk about gear. Let's talk about hardware. You cannot do these types of proof of work um, consensus algorithm using the same type, same type of computers that we are using right now. Because, for example, your laptop or my laptop has a CPU, right? What you need for the purposes of uh, proof of work uh, Bitcoin mining is a different type of hardware. One that does not have a central processing unit but it has what we call an application-specific integrated circuit, a, a, a circuit, not a circuit, cir circuit, ASIC. So these ASIC-type uh, computers, on an average, are about 100,000 times faster than even uh, than, than the, the most uh, powerful uh, CPU chips on the market today. Now, the reason we need such uh, extreme uh, gear, is such extreme hardware, is because in order to put this block together, the miners need to solve a cryptographic puzzle. If the first entity, the first node that can solve this puzzle gets the rewards for putting the blocks together. Uh, the rewards, for example, on the Bitcoin platform right now, if uh, a, a miner puts it together, they get uh, 6.25 Bitcoin, uh, when the reward also gets cut in half every uh, four years. So now, they need to solve a cryptographic problem. A cryptographic problem is a problem that cannot be solved by 
the application of any type of formula. You just have to use a brute force approach. You try something, doesn't work. You have to try some, yeah, another number, another number, another number. And so uh, this needs to get done very fast. So the idea is to guess what a nonce is. I'll show you what that, uh, how that works in the next slide. And the chances of guessing the correct nonce are approximately one in roughly 66 billion trillion uh, chances. And so that is equivalent, I'm told that that is equivalent uh, or not far off from the number of stars in our universe. And so even a low price ASIC mining computer, uh, most of these lower price uh, computers can actually uh, try 56 trillion hashes per second because on the Bitcoin uh, platform, uh, the, the normal speed is that a block gets added to the platform approximately every 10 minutes. So this is how it works. So imagine I, I, we, we just uh, created this to uh, demonstrate uh, how this thing works in the book. So we're working, we put, we're trying to put block one together. The, the, uh, the problem is, is this, what number, nonce, I was told it's short for number used once. Now, I don't know how that translated to nonce, but anyhow, that's, that's another discussion for another day. So we're looking to solve this number, the nonce. Okay, so here's the here's the problem. What number x is the nonce when combined with the data in the block will produce this hash? Right? There is no other way to try to use inference or any type of formula to arrive at this other than brute force. That you have to use different. You, you start uh, put. Uh, inputting a nonce, it, no, it doesn't work, try another one, try another one, try another one, until you land on the correct hash here. The first processing node that can do that, then uh, communicates the results to all the other nodes. It enables the other nodes to verify the veracity of this nonce, that this is the correct nonce. And then once that is done, the uh, processing node earns the right to uh, uh, put the block together. Also note that there are four zeros here at the beginning of the hash. That is a way the Bitcoin platform uh, slows down or speeds up the addition of blocks. So with four, uh, a hash that starts with four zeros denotes the level of difficulty of this problem. That means that on an average, this, this is the type of a, um, a level of difficulty that enables the Bitcoin platform to add a block uh, approximately every uh, 10 minutes. The more zeros that this hash has, the, the bigger the nonce is gonna become and the more difficult that problem is going to be. And that means that it's gonna take longer. So if you wanna slow down on the Bitcoin platform, the, the, uh, the addition of blocks, all you have to do is uh, add zeros to the resulting hash and it, this is going to uh, make the problem uh, more difficult to solve for the various uh, processing nodes. Now, as I mentioned to you, proof of work is very uh, electricity intensive. So now uh, the, the industry has come up with an alternative called proof of stake, where instead of uh, doing this puzzle business, uh, uh, the various nodes or validators are going to be asked to put down a collateral or a deposit in form of cryptocurrency. And um, then the, the whole idea is that you put a deposit and if you win the, the opportunity to put a block together uh, uh, in order to make sure that you're doing this honestly, you're going to post this uh, your, your cryptocurrency as collateral and so in such a way that if you are being dishonest, then you could most likely uh, use part uh, or all of your uh, deposited cryptocurrency. This allows for uh, better efficiency and a whole lot less electricity. And on this slide, you can see that from a terminology perspective, 
for proof of work, we call these processing nodes miners, or but with proof of stake, we call them validators or uh, forgers. And uh, whereas in proof of work, the uh, let's say on, on the Bitcoin platform, the miners receive uh, new coins. There are no new coins uh, that are going to be uh, given to the validators or the forgers, but they get compensated by receiving various transaction fees. And at the end of the day, this is going to be a greener alternative in order to accommodate uh, consensus on the blockchain. There are a number of other blockchain consensus algorithms that have been developed and are being experimented about. These are a, this slide denotes a partial listing of them. Uh, if you're interested in uh, finding out more about these, I would like to draw your attention to page 22 of the book, of, of, of our book. And uh, uh, later on, I'm also going to, uh, we're going to supply you with uh, a link to our library where you can have access to an electronic copy of the auditor's uh, guideline uh, guide to blockchain technology. Now, uh, Dr. Gilly, uh, yes. three minutes left. Oh, uh, really? Okay. So I'm um, uh, I'm almost done here. Uh, and what I was going to say is that in the book, as I mentioned to you guys, uh, there are. Uh, a couple of chapters that deals with security issues. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we looked at it from uh, the user node and network security level. Uh, some of the um, uh, issues deal with uh, failure to protect keys or vulnerabilities to malware or uh, to update the uh, blockchain software. And as you can see here, these are uh, these are identical to some of the um, regular, you know, other types of network uh, problems. Uh, at the node, uh, you know, shared vulnerability or any type of misconfiguration uh, to, to the access control mechanism or any glitches with the APIs uh, associated uh, uh, to the to the blockchain. Those APIs are the components that interact with uh, and bring data into the uh, blockchain uh, for uh, the smart contracts to be able to do their job. So there are some issues that we also looked at that. And of course, uh, given the fact that blockchain is a, uh, is, is, is a network system, it also shares its uh, some of the vulnerabilities that you may see in any type of a network. Uh, so if you're, uh, if you, in case of a private blockchain, if you have glitches uh, at the network level, if the network is uh, flawed or got issues with uh, poor network security, then of course that is also going to, going to affect um, uh, blockchain uh, uh, functions. Uh, at the network attack, number of the different uh, attacks, as you can see here. I don't have the time to uh, really get into any uh, uh, anything here in detail. However, what I'd like to offer you is that if you like to learn more about the security glitches, uh, I invite you to read chapters 13 and 14 of the Auditor's Guide to Blockchain Technology. And if you're affiliated, particularly if you're a current student at Con uh, Concordia, uh, there's the link, and I'm going to ask uh, uh, Dr. Abdallah or Mr. Thomas to drop the uh, link into the uh, chat box, and uh, you can uh, uh, review the uh, book uh, at no cost. And uh, before I uh, end my talk here, I also like to uh, thank you guys for your attendance, and by offering you, uh, we're going to have a drawing for a free autographed copy of the Auditor's Guide to Blockchain Technology. And again, uh, I'll ask Dr. Abdullah or Mr. Uh, Thompson to drop that link as well. Uh, it goes to a Google Doc. Please put in your information, and we will have a drawing. And the lucky winner will be notified within the next week or so. Thank you so, so much. I'm sorry I ran a little bit. We didn't have a lot of time uh, for Q&A or any time. 
Uh, but uh, I, I thank you for your attendance and uh, back to you, Dr. Abdullah. Thank you so much, Dr. Sean, for this interesting talk. And thank you all for attending. So we already uh, shared the uh, book giveaway link. So please try to uh, fill the form for a chance to win this book. And also we shared the auditor's guide to blockchain technology and the paper. So uh, thank you again, Dr. Sean, and thank you all for attending. And we wish to see you again in our uh, next InfoSec seminar, which will be on Thursday, March 9. Thank you all.